Yes, sir. Floor okay. Is yours. So welcome. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting for July 13th, 2021. Uh, I do apologize that I'm not uh, in town hall. Work ran super late, so I'm going to take advantage of the technology this evening. So with that being said, why don't we jump into our scheduled items. First order of business is escapology for the Merrimack Valley change of manager application. Mr. Chairman, with respect, I'm going to open the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance for all the folks here. Please. Thank you very much. Please, thank Please you. rise. All together now. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, do we have Ms. Stewart? Is Ms. Stewart on? Yes, I'm here. Ms. Stewart's okay, attending the remotely. Okay, want to just... Okay. Okay, the, the floor is yours, Ms. Stewart. Hi, so um, so we're here just to um, request a change of manager for our liquor license, um, as I'm now the venue manager over at Escapeology in Tuxbury. Okay, very much, uh, very good. I saw all the paperwork was in line, so this is typically, you know, very typical when we change, um, with the change of management applications. So just short and sweet, uh, this is not a public hearing. So let's open it up to the board. Any questions or concerns? How about Ms. Stronach? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I do not have any questions. I see that all the paperwork is in order as well as the information from the ABCC. So thank you so much for doing such a good job and making my job easier. <laughs> Perfect. How about Ms. Wellman? Uh, I concur with Ms. Stronach. I have no questions. Okay, very good. Mr. Mackey? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay, very good. Mr. Johnson? Uh, same for me, Mr. Chairman. Paperwork looks good. Okay, same here for the chair. So without, no, uh, without any further questions, what is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman? I would like to make a motion to approve the change in manager license for the escapology to uh, Ms. Emily Stewart. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? You do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson. And because I'm the oddball on the WebEx, we have to do a roll call. So, so uh, Ms. Tronic, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Witt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. All right. Next to order of business is Soldier On, uh, a present presentation and request for funding. Come on up. Yep. Please. Yep. Yep. Please. Just pull those mics closer, all right? Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and board. Um, my name is Peter Graham with Soldier On, and I'm joined by um, Bruce Buckley, uh, the CEO. Um, we are here to uh, request for funding from the Affordable Housing Trust for the support of the 21 proposed units at 1660 Main Street. And so uh, we did provide the board with a presentation uh, some number of months ago with, uh, with the, uh, the plans and we are in front of planning board uh, on the last month and again next week. Uh, so in this case, we can understand that this, that this request is, uh, is something that helps us, uh, actually is essential for us to get the state funding um, to kind of make this this community a reality. The, okay, the, thank you. Sure. Okay, go ahead. No, I was just going to say uh, the the funding request of three hundred fifty thousand dollars is a, just over sixteen thousand per unit, and the entire uh, budget, while it's still preliminary. Uh, we would be looking for over $4.8 million from the state in terms of some of the various soft debt that allows for a community like this to be built. So that's over $200,000 a unit. So this is a kind of uh, 
uh, a leveraging impact of getting a, a lot of great state and federal support for veterans housing here in town. Thank you. Okay, very good. And and like you said, you came in front of us and you showed us the presentation. It was very, very nice. So now it's kind of the latter phase. He had to request funding. So what I'd like to do is maybe kick it off to Ms. Stronach. So Ms. Stronach is on the local housing board. So maybe Ms. Stronach, just for the board, kind of give us some insight because this is very typical um, for requests to come in and, and to request funding. So Ms. Stronach, maybe you want to just help the residents understand and the board understand kind of what um, Soldier Home was asking for? Sure. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for coming back in and again presenting. I know that you have presented several times within the community. So first of all, we appreciate that. I'd also le like to recognize Vinny Fatilia is also with us tonight. He is a member of the local housing and um, I know that I had spoken to uh, Chairman Reed, who was the chair of the local housing. While the local housing, um, our mission, as you know, is to ensure that the community um, has affordable housing within the community. The Veterans Project became pretty apparent that this actually was kind of a no-brainer for us, um, if you don't mind me saying so, because not only are we um, able to um, help our veterans within our community. We we're also able to provide, I believe it's 21 units. That's correct. Um, and they will all be counted towards our inventory. So that's great news for us. And the funds that you're asking for, which is a um, little over 16,000 per unit, is aligned with what the housing fund would typically be um, suited and actually is a pretty good bargain compared to some of the other projects that we have done with the local um, housing partnership trust fund. Um, so I can tell you that the partnership supported this project, but we did not vote on the money because that authority sits with this board and not with the housing, but they were very strongly um, in favor of this project as well as um, when you came to present to us. And I think that I've captured all of it. And I think that you have um, seven of these across the Commonwealth. That's right. So uh, Bruce can give a little more background on the, the size and scope of what Soldron does. But as I mentioned in the letter, this would be the seventh funded by the Department of Housing and Community Development here in the state. We do have things outside of the state. But these are uh, that this would be the seventh veteran community within the state. And then I would be remiss if I didn't um, also thank um, our assistant town manager Steve Sadwick, who has also helped the partnership and shepherd us through this process as well. Agreed. Thank you. Would you like to add? Yeah, I just add. Uh, first of all, Tewksbury has been great to work with, and um, I think we've been able to move quickly with what Vinny and his team have kind of put together for this opportunity. And as Peter said, this will be the seventh property that we've done in the state, and we've learned a lot, and I think we've improved a lot, and not just offering housing, because I think sometimes that's what gets lost on what we're able to do. But we've got a and I won't talk long because I could talk too long, but we have a lot of services that we've added to really support the veterans, <clears throat> including a, a meal a day, which we deliver. We deliver them to Brighton Mass now um, with a project we're working on Brighton Marine. We provide case management, we provide a lot of transportation, and we actually are successful in all of Western Mass in being able to expand our transportation and hire sometimes formerly homeless or lower income veterans to be drivers and work in the program and provide at no cost to veterans in the community other transportation to veterans not in the building. So again, I think you know once you get a, a real sense to uh, see what we're able to do and what we've been doing for over 10 years, and a lot of it's been in Western Mass, but it's the same model that we certainly thrilled to bring here. Thank you. Okay, perfect, very good. Maybe we'll just do a quick round table with the board. Um, Ms. Wellman, questions, uh, comments? Uh, thank you, um, I support this project. I'm, I appreciate you guys coming back again and um, the work that you have done and will be doing within our community. Um, I did have a question for uh, Mr. Sadrick or the manager. Uh, what is the balance 
right now of the um, housing authority, the trust fund that we're it's looking for here, affordable housing trust, excuse me. It's approximately $5.1 million. Thank you very much. All right, that was my one primary question. You've done a great job in your presentations, and I think it's been a complete picture. Uh, when, when do you think you will um, begin construction? Once so, you secure the rest of your funding? That's right, that's right. So I, I, I did, um, it, our proposed development schedule has a, uh, a funding for the supportive housing round with the state that would be this fall. Um, hopefully, if we are funded in the first round, uh, we would know by December. Mm -hmm. We would uh, close on that financing in the likely the first quarter of next year, and it would be probably a, between a 10 to 13 month construction schedule, depending on how busy, crazy, and everything the construction industry is at that time. Uh, so it, it would really lease up would be uh, March 30, 2023 would probably be an optimistic uh, view on that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How about, thank you. How about uh, Mr. Mackey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have no questions, just a comment. Great project. Happy to see this is moving forward. As a veteran myself, this is something that kind of really brings me joy. I'm glad we can assist with this. And um, that's it. I wish you guys the best, and hopefully we can. you guys can do well here. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Very good. How about uh, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, um, let me acknowledge um, in my uh, 14, 15 years, it's been a long time since we've had this many people in the room. So um, I want to commend those of you who are interested in Tewksbury Municipal Government for coming out tonight. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Can, can you just speak to the ask of 350,000 specifically? How did you get to that number? Is it formulaic? Is there a budgetary need that ties back to state funding? How do you get to that, that ask? Uh, I didn't know there was 5.1 million in the, in the, in the, in the bank. <laughs> No. Only um, one bite at the apple. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You're um, locked in now. I, I am, uh, you know, I've been doing affordable housing development for over 20 years here in Massachusetts. And not every community funds an affordable housing trust fund like this. And in so many cases, you're you're lucky to get uh, $10,000 a unit mm -hmm. or, or, you know, even sometimes $200 a unit. Uh, it really is one of those uh, sad scenarios for funding mm -hmm. affordable housing. So in this case, it was there was no real formula. There was just uh, kind of research done, uh, working with uh, folks in the region, looking at what we had going, and not wanting to, you know, scare anybody away. Mm -hmm. We we really need this to more than check the box with the state. The state expects uh, a community like this with a fund that you have to uh, to be a part of these projects and um, and it really it really is just that just kind of a, a looking to not take too big of a bite okay and and just to follow on your comment um, I would agree with you that the town has done a great job of um, amassing a, a little bit of a nest egg in this area mm -hmm. but we haven't um, we've struggled to find the right projects right. Um, to use these funds for, and they are um, something that has to be used specifically in this area. So, um, and, so that's a good ask. And, and I should also acknowledge that the um, you know the land, while Tewksbury Home Build secured it as a part of a larger development that had an affordable uh, kind of requirement. Um, that that doesn't go unnoticed by the state or folks like us as well to kind of have an opportunity to get a piece of land uh, like this and try to make the very most of it. Um, so we appreciate the effort of the town and their zoning bylaws to kind of arrange that to happen. Yeah. So I, I know Mr. Buckley um, spoke briefly about um, the myriad services that you offer in support of the veterans. So I, I don't want to go down that road. I just want to acknowledge um, I think that's an important component, right, is the support structure. Um, so my, I have two other questions, um, one for you gentlemen, um, and that really is a selfish question. It's about Tewksbury. So um, what, 
what have you done in other communities and what might you envision here in Tewksbury that would allow Tewksbury veterans um, access? Do they have a right of preferential placement or is there anything in your past practices that supports um, Tewksbury residents where this is a Tewksbury property? I'll let you take that with the one caveat of saying that in projects that get this significant funding from the state, there are, there are uh, they do allow local preference to a limit and you just have to substantiate the need for that local preference. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of the official bylaws of that. But besides that, Bruce can talk about who we serve and how local they are. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, to Peter's point, there are the rules that go with affordable housing that we certainly yep. abide by. But whatever rule we can, we're certainly focused on the local community because that's where we're going to be most successful. And I think that's where the impact needs to be made. Um, so I think, you know, once we get through this process of this, I'll call it pre-development, um, we would begin to really communicate with the VSOs, um, with other people politically and other veteran agencies in the the immediate area and really begin to beat the drum. We're doing this in Tinton Falls, New Jersey, where we do a lot of services down in New Jersey, and we've got a 70 unit project that's gonna open up in October. And it's the same thing. Tinton Falls reminds me of Tewksbury. I mean, they've been very supportive. They've been very good. I feel like we're part of the community early on, and we've been able to compile a list of eligible veterans that is made up not maybe just Tinton Falls, but Monmouth County in the very immediate area. And, um, you know, we can exercise, I'm not gonna say control, but certainly influence and energy to make sure that occurs. So I know that we can't dictate that, but um, I would certainly urge you to hold true to that representation, right? This is, um, essentially a partnership. So we want to make sure it works for everybody. Veterans first, certainly your organization in, in the town of Tewksbury. So I think and this is our experience. Yeah. I mean, we've been to Agawam, Chicopee. I mean, we're yeah. in other towns in the state yeah. that it's the same, you know, general, because there's yeah. plenty of veterans that need not just the housing, as you said, but really the supportive services. Agreed. And it, you know, it begins to fill a, an elderly housing need also yeah. for aging veterans that frees up other housing that I'm sure is hard to come by. It's much needed, so yeah. I appreciate that. Um, thank you, gentlemen. My, my last question is uh, just um, hopefully a takeaway for Mr. Montori or Mr. Sadwick or combination and, and maybe involves the housing partnership, but um, Ms. Mrs. Stronach referenced the 16,666 cost per unit that we would be contributing potentially. So um, if, if it's possible for you um, to compile some info, maybe bring it back to the board, I'd be interested in benchmarking that number against our historical performance. I know that we made a substantial, I think it was a million seven, if my recollection is correct, a few years back um, for um, a number of units. I, I, was it maybe like 75 units or something in that neighborhood, if I recall correctly? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in how that number compares to prior use of these funds from an, a return on investment perspective. If, if you could pull some of that together, I think it would be helpful for us moving forward doesn't impact my decision here tonight, but I think it would be beneficial um, in the future as we get into more of these. So thank you. Okay, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Just simply put for me, it's the right project. Uh, I'm wholeheartedly behind this. Um, we did a little bit of research based on the last few years, and sometimes I saw some cost at about 20K per unit or 25K per unit. So I think, think the 16K was very, very reasonable in this, in this situation um, for the 21 units. So with that being said, I have no other questions or comments. So at this point, I guess I'll turn it back over to the board. What is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a Please. motion to approve the $350,000 for the Soldier On project um, out of the Affordable Trust Fund. Second. Okay. I have I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. 
Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. The chair votes aye as well. Thank you very much, Peter and Bruce. Thank you guys very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, did you hear that question? You may not. No, I'm sorry. There's not a microphone in the room. Um, a resident asked if the public can make comments about this project. Uh, they cannot. This is not a public hearing. However, we're going to get to the resident section here very, very shortly. So we're going to hold comments until the resident section. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Okay, as the gentleman, uh, the next order of business is the Hanover presentation, 300 Ames Pond. Um, you know, please come to the front. Um, in the meantime, I just want to update the folks, you know, in town hall and the residents watching and the board for that matter. So um, this this project has been the talk of the town. We, the select board, actually pushed this off um, to have the local housing uh, partnership um, have the first review of it, if you would. It's usually up their warehouse. However, that meeting fell through, so I felt uh, obligated as a chair to bring, to bring the Hanover uh, group in to give us a presentation. So there's no, just for all the residents and everyone, like I said, in town hall, there's no uh, applications on the table. This is just for, to kind of present high level presentation of what they're thinking. And we'll probably revisit this down the road. But again, it's been the talk of the town. I didn't want to hold off any longer. I wanted them uh, to come in front of the board and the residents and share what their, um, you know, their plans were. And then what I'll do, open it up, we'll open it up for questions from the board. And again, we purposely put the residents after because we know this is near and dear to many residents. So with that being said, um, do we have representation from the Hanover group? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a pre actual uh, presentation to share? We do, and that's, I was just going to ask if okay. you were able to see it. It's on the screen at the front of the room right now. Yeah. It's a little like Oz. Okay, so, the room, so you have to just look this way. You're not going to see him. <laughs> and Mr. Chairman, before, um, before our guests um, begin their presentation, um, I do want to acknowledge, we did have an email from a resident. I know he's in the room because he just asked the question, Mr. O'Brien. Um, but I do want to acknowledge the email that he forwarded um, to um, the board and I believe the town manager, assistant town manager, relative to the timing of this presentation during vacation time. Um, so I just wanted to put in the record um, that we received it. Um, this is being recorded, as you stated. Um, there are no votes being taken tonight. It will be replayed. People can get access to it. Um, and hopefully um, there'll be ample time before there's another discussion. But I felt it important to at least recognize and acknowledge that email. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Good catch. Thank you very much. Good. Very good. Okay, for the applicants, maybe just do a quick introduction about yourselves, and then we can, you can slide into the presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Steve Dazzo. I'm a development partner with the Hanover Company. Thank you for having us here this evening. It's great to be here in person. Um, as has been stated uh, a couple different times, at this point, no formal filings have been made. This is an informational presentation. Um, as the board is aware, we submitted a cover letter on July 7th um, that we will be seeking support for a, a lit project. Um, and this is the first step in that process to give you an overview of, of that project. So. Um, just a quick agenda for tonight. We'll do some introductions to the project team, the project itself, some of the objectives we're, we're looking to achieve, um, and you know, outline the permitting process. I'm going to open up to questions from the board. And, and with me here tonight is, is Mark Vaughn with Reamer and Bronstein, who's, who is our counsel, and also Hunter Hagdorn with the Hanover Company, who's an associate with me. Thank you. So this first slide is an introduction to the Hanover Company. We are a privately held national developer of multifamily housing um, with a strategic focus in, in luxury rental housing. We, we don't do age-restricted product. We don't do for sale con condos. All we do is, is uh, rental housing um, that is, is non-age restricted. Um, we have done over 50,000 apartment homes across the nation 
uh, we have a, a significant presence here in Greater Boston. We have an office here um, and, and approximately 50 to 60 employees in Greater Boston. So although we're a Texas-based company, we have a substantial presence here. Um, and we have developed over 5,000 apartment homes here in, in eastern Massachusetts across 17 eastern Massachusetts cities and towns at this point. And we also have a substantial development pipeline um, with well over 1,000 uh, apartment homes that are currently under development and permitting in other communities as well. As you can see, we've done 23 projects in 16 different cities and towns in Greater Boston. So I'd like to start with just some of the development objectives for this project and, and really why we're here. Um, so first and foremost is we'd like to assist the town in achieving a subsidized housing inventory of greater than 10% for the foreseeable future. We understand there's some uncertainty as to where the town is going to fall as it relates to that 10% number when the 2020 census comes out. Um, we have, this, is, this is not the first time we have proposed a project like this that allows the town to be in control of their destiny moving forward um, and not have to um, you know, be dealing with 40 Bs um, you know, down the road. So that's, that's number one. Number two is to provide alternative housing choices that satisfy a demand from a broad demographic in terms of income level and unit types that addresses the town's needs for, uh, for rental housing. And when I say a broad demographic and broad um, range of incomes, that's not just the affordable units, that's the market rate units too. This is a housing uh, type that is, is not very prevalent um, in, in the region and we're all aware of, of the regional need for more housing. So that's number two. Number three is to implement sustainable development practices and preserve open space. I'll get into some of the details of the site itself and, and we'll talk more about number three when we see the site plan. Number four is consider and respect abutters and abutting uses in site planning. At this point, we have had two informational presentations very similar to what we're doing tonight with the, the local neighborhood, the direct abutters, um, many of whom are here this evening. So it, it, and that, those presentations were exactly what we're doing here tonight. So I'm glad you know, folks are here, um, and, but we do want to hear them and hear their concerns and make sure those are incorporated into the design. And number five is develop a project that is fiscally positive to the town. At this point, we have not conducted a fiscal impact analysis. That is something we would propose to do during the comprehensive permit process with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, we have run a number of fiscal impact processes for um, uh, analyses for our other projects in the region. And I'm, I won't say all, but most of them, really it is all of them, are very uh, fiscally positive to the town. And just a few notes on uh, the proposed demand drivers and renter profile for who may be living here, many of which um, are outlined in the town's housing production plan. But number one is we're gonna have a timeless design that's high, with highly appointed amenity spaces and top of the line finishes that are attractive to, to all demographics. Um, so it's, it's the millennial population, it's young families, it's the aging population who wants to remain in town. Um, there's, there's one bedroom units, two bedroom units, and three bedroom units. So it really does cross the demographic spectrum. And our product is, is so high quality um, that anybody would be happy to live there. Um, and you know, I will offer, you know, I'm happy to meet folks at uh, some of our nearby properties, one of which is on Littleton Road in Westford. Um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with it, but our website was up at the beginning of the presentation. So I welcome folks to see the, the level of quality that we deliver, and I am happy to, to host site tours as well. Uh, number two is, is proximity to uh, the, the infrastructure and, and highway systems that allow people to get where they need to be. Um, obviously, this site is, is situated um, at, you know, an in, in interchange for 495 and very close to 93 as well. Uh, number three on here is, is to provide housing for the aging population. I started with we don't do age-restricted product, but that doesn't mean our product does not appeal to that demographic. It is maintenance-free, it is elevator-served, 
Uh, it is a community where folks can stay with their neighbors and stay in town if, if they live here and want to sell the big home. Uh, so that's number three. And the last one is uh, we're all aware of, of what's happening with the prices of single family homes and providing an alternative housing choice um, gives people an opportunity to have, you know, to stay in town, to keep their kids in the school system. Um, so it is providing a, a housing alternative that is, is not very prevalent. <clears throat> So this is a locational overview. Um, as folks could see, this is 93. Here's 495. This, this blue shape here is Ames Pond itself. That's a 77-acre pond. And the site in question is outlined in white. And this is just a little closer view here. So the parcel in question um, goes all the way up to the roundabout. It's this access drive to 100 and 200 Ames Pond, which are the existing office buildings, and 300 Ames Pond is here in the back. It's approximately 30 acres. There are some wetlands on the site. So a little bit about the site history. I've, I've pulled um, some of the, the projects that have previously been presented or approved over the years. The first one, this is approximately a 200,000 square foot office building, which was approved in the early 2000s. As you can tell, the site is almost entirely impervious area. Um, this is the building itself here, and there's a sea of 792 surface parking spaces here with remote parking over here as well. As you can see, or you may not be able to tell, this is the wetland area that more or less bifurcates the site. So there's a section of developable land um, adjacent to the Andover town line over here. And then the other section is over here. This is Cardigan Road along the back and here's the pond itself. What you're seeing here is our initial site plan, which we presented at our first meeting with the, the abutters. Um, so we think about this as a higher density site plan that shows what could max out the density on this site. This was 364 units using uh, both sides of the wetland area here. After our initial meeting with the abutters, uh, we did dial back the number of units and change the site plan so, to what you see and what was uh, presented as part of our July 7th letter. And that's the next slide here. So I'll spend a little bit of time here, but this is the current site plan. Obviously, we don't have engineered plans at this time. Um, we understand the grades out there. We, we know this works. Um, this, is, this product type is based off of uh, all of the other development projects we've done that are very similarly situated to this, to this uh, site itself. So the entry drive is at the top of the screen right here and provides access uh, around the entirety of the site. What you see, building number one here is an amenity uh, space that contains the leasing offices, the fitness center, demonstration kitchen, the movie theater, the, the game room. Um, so those functions all happen as soon as you enter the site here. Um, and then the other five buildings are all four-story buildings housing the residential units. Typically, we would or orient these around a centrally located courtyard with the, the beautiful natural amenity that is Ames Pond itself. Um, we've decided to try to focus the view corridors on the pond. We do have uh, significant courtyards here at the front of the property where we are showing the resort style pool. Um, we have barbecue grills um, circulated throughout the site. We have a dog park um, <clears throat> and the, the project itself is served primarily by surface parking. These ancillary structures are sing uh, single story detached garages and there are bike rooms attached to those as well. One thing I also wanna highlight about this plan is you could see the, the lower property line here, which is this dark hash line where the hand is shown. So what we are currently proposing is a setback of 100 feet of no disturb off of the, the, that property line. There's a 50 foot line right in the middle there and then it's 100 feet uh, to where we're starting the development. We would propose to have a, a wood stockade fence back here and add significant landscaping to buffer this area um, in addition to what exists between 
the, the development site and uh, the <coughs> neighboring abutters. Um, we have also offered to work with them on screening the project even further, both in their yards, um, along our property line, or contribute to their own screening. So um, we're happy to continue to work with them. Um, that has not been fully resolved at this point, but we do want the, them involved um, in the process. This is the currently proposed unit mix. The project total is 324 units, 25% per <coughs> which are proposed to be affordable at the 80% AMI limit. That totals 81 affordable units and the balance of 243 being market rate units. You can see the, the breakdown of the unit types. So it's about 56% one bedrooms, 32% two bedrooms, and just over 10% three bedrooms. So as I started with, we are appealing and offering housing choices to um, you know, quite a, a broad demographic. <clears throat> And these last few slides are, are precedent images of some of our other projects, just to show the quality of finishes and landscaping that we do um, inside and outside of the building. So this is our Hanover Westford Valley project off of Littleton Road. This is a project that we did in Swampscott in 2016. These are some pictures of the interior amenity spaces. So we'll have conference rooms and meeting rooms and lounge areas, a media room, we'll have game rooms. Um, you know, one note I will make as it relates to um, COVID-19 is we are you know, offering more e-lounges, work from home spaces. Um, and those spaces have always been included in our projects, but we are skewing a little bit more towards that as we are seeing more folks working from home. A few pictures of our Westford project in the exterior spaces. So swimming pool, fire pits, seating areas. And then some of our, our precedent images for landscape screening and, and buffering. So as you can see in both of these, these are uh, th this is additional landscaping that is mature day one to enhance what's existing in those areas. And then one quick slide on green initiatives. Um, all of our projects um, incorporate a number of green initiatives into the design. We would propose to be uh, to achieve or be NGBS bronze certifiable. Um, we would include pet friendly spaces, EV ready parking spaces, bike storage areas, uh, energy star appliances, all LED lighting, uh, private irrigation well, drought tolerant plants, um, you know, locally sourced framing materials, pre-finished wood flooring and cabinetry. I, I won't go through everything, but there's, there's quite a few items here that um, you know, we have to always taken into consideration as part of the development process. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mark to talk about the, the proposed permitting path, and then we can open up to questions from the board. Uh, good evening again, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, for the record, attorney Mark Vaughn with uh, Reamer Bronstein, a uh, law firm I'm based in uh, Burlington where we have an office and uh, pleased to be before you. But um, I really don't have a lot to add beyond uh, what, what uh, Steve had, had mentioned and gone through, but I, we're really here to you know, uh, establish a dialogue with the, the town and the board and hopefully work cooperatively with you on an application that is uh, something that you know the town could embrace and, and support. So. I understand from going through your housing production plan, which um, is obviously uh, you know a, a record document that you have that I know the town had worked on before, but um, it, it, the, the preference of the town for someone coming forward with a development like this is to go through a, a LIP, a local initiative uh, program uh, process, where ideally uh, you know the board of selectmen, the local housing partnership, all have a seat at the table and work collaboratively with the applicant to put something forth that accomplishes a number of objectives for the town, which you know we do feel that this uh, project would accomplish a number of objectives for the town. As I understand it currently, based on DHCD um, data that they have in terms of the affordable housing inventory, I think the town may be just at or a little bit over 10% uh, today. Uh, I think as Steve alluded to, with the upcoming census coming up, uh, which I believe is going to be coming out in September, uh, it's my understanding that the town may be dipping a little bit below uh, 10%. So 
the um, I, I, I don't know for certain. I just I, I'm, I'm, uh, that's what I, I understand, I guess. But um, th that that's a possibility. So really what this is able to accomplish uh, for the town would be to uh, allow the town to be perhaps proactive, um, control their own destiny. I think, as Steve mentioned, if you know the, the board and the town feel that this is a, a location that has merit for, for this type of uh, use and in this uh, location. I think one of the advantages, uh, uh, there's a number of advantages, but one of them that, Steve, you, you may, have, may not have mentioned, but um, even though only 25% of the units would be set aside as affordable, as a rental development, the town is able to count all 324 <coughs> of the units towards its affordable housing inventory. So that would enable the town to uh, be able to, you know, create um, kind of a, a cushion, so to speak, beyond that 10%. Um, I know that quite often, as, as every community, you've always got single family subdivisions that come online and whatnot, where, you know, those add to the denominator without necessarily adding to the numerator of affordable units. So. Uh, this would, you know, allow for uh, the town to be able to gain a bit of a cushion to insulate yourself if, you know, you, you find out that you, you know, aren't necessarily interested in something else some, somewhere else in town. Um, you know, we do think the site has a lot of intrinsic uh, value to it for this type of use. You know, we feel that it uh, uh, could be deemed a, a complementary use to, you know, the office park use that's out there from a traffic perspective. You know, we, we're not adding, you know, AM traffic coming in, people would be coming out. There would be a traffic analysis, obviously, that would need to be done. But, you know, we feel like there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sense behind this type of, uh, of use in a, in a location uh, like that and uh, proximity to the highway and, and, and all of that. So, um, but again, I know that the town has, um, you know, a policy in terms of, you know, working cooperatively with this board, the, the local housing partnership as well as I think the planning board would need to be involved. Ultimately, I think the, the permit granting authority would be the ZBA, I think, as you all know. So that would be the application that ultimately is sub submitted working with DHCD uh, as well uh, through the process. So um, with that, I, um, I really didn't have much more to, to add other than, you know, I think, you know, we're uh, very anxious and desirous of, of, you know, hopefully working cooperatively with you on, on something that you know, could accomplish a number of objectives for the for the town. I mean, I, I know your housing production plan does indicate that, you know, one of the acute needs is to provide rental housing specifically, and this would obviously uh, do that. And, you know, look, as, I guess, as Steve mentioned, um, the, the, the housing market is getting tougher and tougher right now, right? I mean, you hear, you know, Governor Baker's initiatives for the housing choice bill where he changed the legislation. so. You know, zoning initiatives now that encourage multifamily. I think it's a simple majority vote as opposed to two thirds. I mean, throughout the Commonwealth, I think everyone's focused on the need for for housing. It's one of the key drivers for economic growth and sustainability. So, um, but um, that's my story, and I'm I'm sticking to it. So, uh, pleased to be before you. So, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So this is a listen. This is a, you know this is the kind of the first pass for many of us here. Um, that was nice that you had a couple of informational sessions with the abutters. I'm sure we're going to need a heck of a lot more than two. So I'm sure the board has a lot of questions. Again, this was info info only. So maybe I would ask the board maybe one or two questions at a high level. Um, you know what we'll do is we'll close this out. If we'll, we'll let the Hanover group go on their way, and then we'll listen to the residents. What I don't want to get into this evening is uh, going back and forth and stuff we're not going to solve tonight, but we do want to listen to the abutters and obviously the residents um, through this board. So with that being said, maybe Ms. Stronach, you want to kick us off? Questions, questions, concerns, thoughts? Thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming in. I really appreciate the presentation. And um, other than the information that was provided to us in the letter, there's a lot to absorb here tonight. And typically I have a million questions, but for tonight, I want to reserve my questions. I am sure that when you come before local housing, we'll have some issues that we want to talk about. I really appreciate the insight and the time that you've taken to work with the abutters already. And I am, my one question is, how did those meetings come to be? And um, how many attended those meetings? So thank you for the question. I believe I made the initial outreach. I was put in touch with one of the abutters who uh, coordinated with 
um, the direct abutters, and I'm, I'm not exactly certain how many folks were reached out to. I would say there was probably 30 to 40 at the first meeting, and maybe 20 to 25 at the second meeting. Great. And then I just um, would like to thank the town manager and Steve Sadwick again because um, they provided us some um, information on all of the projects and kind of the density of those things. So I'm looking at that information as well. So um, unfortunately, I haven't had enough time to dig deep into all of this information. And if we could get a copy of that PowerPoint, that would be fantastic as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. How about, yep, how about Ms. Weldon? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for coming before the board this evening. Um, I personally was ex uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, come and hear about this project um, at a high level. Um, it's been um, a topic of conversation in the community, as you can see, and, um, and I've heard from a number of people on it, not only in uh, the letter we received over the weekend from an, uh, Butter, but also... Uh, over the course of many months and from some of the folks who attended your meeting. So again, I, I'm excited to hear about what your vision is, um, and I thank you for coming. Um, I have a number of um, questions and the things that I'm typically concerned with with projects in town, not just something along these lines. Um, and I, I'm, these are things that I look forward to hearing more about in the future, um, but protections for open space, you talked a little bit about that. Um, you're proposing um, a large development on Ames Pond. Um, when you came before these boards previously to create the Lodge at Ames Pond project, um, there was a promise at one point to create access to the pond, um, which wasn't able to happen for whatever reason. So that is something that I would want to see is access for residents in perpetuity into that, uh, that pond and also maintenance of that um, of that pond for things like milfoil and algae and things like that um, so that residents can access that at all times. Um, there are three dams on this property, and I was wondering if you were prepared to manage the dams. Um, it's a major safety issue for our residents in the area. Um, I know that there'll be some school-aged children there, and you talked about families living there. We've, I personally know uh, families that are experiencing housing hardship, um, and I can speak to the fact that we have a tremendous need in this community for affordable housing. Um, my colleague, Ms. Stronach, and her colleagues on the Local Housing Partnership and our colleagues on the Housing Authority do a tremendous job to manage the units we have and to carefully develop. So I look to them for their guidance um, and their professionalism and their recommendations before this board. And I'll be doing that again. Um, but again, back to school-aged children. Previously, I was on the school committee. Um, I would want to make sure that our school buses can access the site safely in all seasons. Um, that was an issue with the previous, um, the previous development that was overcome. But um, I'm also going to be looking for recommendations from law enforcement due to the density, um, just because there's more, more folks living close together. It, it does put um, strains on our um, law enforcement, our public safety professionals. Um, and then I was curious to know how many of the projects you have in Massachusetts fall under the 40B uh, provision? I believe the answer is 11 or 12. Of um, how many? Of 23. Of 23. Okay. So about half, a little less than half. That's a fair, that's a fair assessment, okay. yes. All right. Um, the last question I have um, is um, about infrastructure and um, mitigation that we're going to be looking for. Um, as we, as a project like this would be impacting our um, water and sewer infrastructure, our uh, traffic, you did mention there'll be a traffic study done, which would be apropos and expected. Um, pedestrian safety and bicycle safety, you mentioned you have bicycle assets uh, storage on the property. Um, I've been on those committees in this community. Um, it's a priority in this town for sidewalks and for pedestrian safety. We'll be looking for those, um, those items as well. So those are my um, very 10,000 foot 
thoughts at this time. Um, and I, I concur with Ms. Stronach that there's a lot to absorb from your presentation, so I do look forward to um, grabbing a copy of that. Um, and once again, I want to thank you for coming before us this evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Ms. Wellman. Good stuff. Hello, uh, Mr. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Ms. Wellman was very thorough, um, hit all the, the high points I was going to speak on. Uh, the primary two that I really want to kind of reiterate are there's a lot of attention usually given to population, to law enforcement resources, to schools. But I think your last point for me was one of the most important. So considering the infrastructure and the additional use and stress that's going to be put on the system, I want to make sure that we're doing all, everything that needs to be done for looking at our sewer, water, and sidewalks additionally. Um, other than that, I have no questions. Thank you. How about uh, Mr. Johnson? Thank you. Um, I won't repeat because some of my questions have already been asked and answered. But um, just to follow up on um, the meetings you've had with Direct Abutters, um, you mentioned the um, attendance level, but um, when were they? Um, in the recent past, um, last 30, 60 days, or longer than that? The first one, I believe, was in March, March or April, and the second one was May. I, I, I can pull and send exact dates, but they were late spring. In the current calendar year? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, and then um, when you talked about, during your presentation, the scaling back of the 364 to 324, um, and you uh, you showed us the maps. Um, what happened to the the second more remote parcel? Is that remaining vacant, or are you proposing using that for something? Yes, it's so. currently just proposed as open space. It's it's okay. still up here on the screen. I, I believe this dark line here is the okay. the Andover town line, and there's just nothing and proposed. Your intention is to leave that as is. Yes, sir. All right, and then um, in response to um, Ms. Wellman's question about um, how many of your uh, pre-existing projects were 40B, um, if, if the number's roughly half, um, were they all LIPs or how many did you go through the LIP process on? No, I, I believe we've done two or three LIP projects. Um, and I, I should have started with, we did develop the Lodge at Ames Pond, I believe it was in 2007. I was not with Hanover at the time. That's a 364-unit project, which is above the large project review threshold for 40B. But from my understanding, that was not a LIP. It was a project that was supported by this board, but it went through the regular 40B process. Yeah, that's um, but separate, back to the question, we, we've done two or three LIP projects. I don't have exact numbers for yeah. which permitting path each one was. I, I can get that for you okay. if you would like. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested in that. Um, and do you have any comments high level about any lessons learned in that process versus other methods that you followed? Anything general worth noting? Well, I think my, my general co comment is the, the LIP process is, is known as the friendly 40B process. And in our experience, whether it's a LIP or the, a standard 40B, we like to look at all of them as a friendly process where we reach out to all the boards. We seek input from all the boards. Um, in terms of experience from one or the other, I, you know, I, I don't really have anything to add on that. It's, it's just, um, you know, it, it varies town to town. Um, but we generally like to, you know, consider all of our projects as friendly processes. Okay. okay. And I, I, I think your history demonstrated that for the most part by my recollection um, and the prior development. Um, all right, just a, a process question. Council, I don't know if you can answer this or maybe um, <clears throat> I'll fall back to um, our town manager, but I'm just curious about the sequencing of timing. Right? If you do pursue a LIP and it has to come back before this board um, and the permit, the comprehensive permit is a ZBA or Zoning Board of Appeals topic. Um, does the LIP have to be approved here before it goes to the um, zoning board, or does does it matter in, in the sequencing? I don't recall. Yeah, but, but my understanding is that it, it would happen first before it goes to the ZBA as part of a technical comprehensive permit. Okay. So, um, you know, the application would be, you know, worked on, you know, with the town, the input of the of the town, 
And, uh, you know, we were involved with one, my firm, uh, different developer, no offense, Steve, but in, uh, <laughs> in Burlington, we're very similar in some respects where Burlington was a little bit over 10 percent, but worried about uh, or thinking about where they were going to be in the next few years. So we worked on a project called the Reserve, which is in Corporate Drive in Burlington, mm -hmm. uh, about a 300 unit, uh, so roughly, I forget the exact number. But in that instance, the town, um, you know, really you know, co-signed the application, you know, it was part of the process. You know, we work with all the town departments to properly assess what the impacts were, were going to be. And, but then ultimately, uh, the application gets submitted to the comp, to the ZBA, who is the permit granting authority. Yeah. So, okay. All right. All right. So do you have, um, uh, a timeline in your head? If you are going to pursue a LIP, when would you expect that that would be formally presented to the town? Well, I, I think we would like to be able to get going as, as quickly as you all would feel comfortable going forward. Um, I guess that's the, the short answer to it. I think we're desirous. Uh, they have a, an agreement to purchase the property, and, uh, you know, they'd like to be able to, you know, move forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that perhaps in the, to maybe in the town's best interest as well to, you know, move yeah. forward. So. Okay. All right. All right. That's helpful. All right, so you know I won't I won't uh, belabor the questions this evening, but you know there's a lot of issues and concerns that some have been stated already around um, mitigation, abutter protections, all of those things. They're very very important um, in in any um, lip project. Obviously, you've stated it. This is essentially a, a partnership, so all of those things have to be tied off to the satisfaction of all parties. So. Um, I welcome further discussion. I don't have a, a firm position because this is the first time I've seen the presentation. It seems like most people in this room have at least potentially have seen it more than, than I have. So I'm learning and just getting up to speed on it. But I look forward to more information and as much as you can share with us, the better off we all will be. So I thank you for that. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. So right. So, so uh, how about that? Just in 10 minutes alone, we probably had 25 questions, and that was at a very high level, at a very, very high level. So to, to the board's point, um, we need to do our homework, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to have um, not only just for the director, but for the town. If we start doing math on 324 units, not only impact um, in North Tewksbury in that section, but just as a town alone to the, to the schools, the fire police, the first respondents. So um, I have a lot more. I have a lot more questions than answers, and that's okay. This was a whole part of it um, for the um, just information only, but to the board's point, um, you can see we have a lot of questions because this is significant. This is a very, very significant um, project that would be undertaken in Tewksbury, so you can only imagine, um, again, not only the, the, the direct abutters, but just the residents as a whole within Tewksbury having questions, concerns, and thoughts. And um, But I think the board did a very good job at a high level covering that everything I was going to cover Cover. So at this point, again, there was no action. So I, 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 I thank, um, I do thank Hanover for coming in. What I'd like to do at this point, I think it's best if we wrap up. We can wrap up. If there's any, I'll pause for a second. Any other questions, comments from the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I had one quick one. Please. Thank you, um, gentlemen. What is the um, market rate for your rate, your units that you're targeting at this point, or, or that you're um, able to seek in this market? Um, and then, what would your affordable rate be? In your terms of the rates? rent level, correct. So the market rate, the average rent, will be around twenty-five to twenty-six hundred dollars a month. So that's really you can equate it to one of the two-bedroom units is generally around that price. One bedrooms would be closer to two thousand dollars a month. Sure. Three bedrooms closer to three thousand or and plus. Okay. Um, the affordable rents are, as you know, are, are set rents, um, yep. and I have them written somewhere. But I believe it's around fifteen hundred dollars a month. Um, on average, so I think the the one bedrooms are closer to eleven to twelve hundred. Okay. Two bedrooms are fourteen to fifteen. Yeah. And the threes are seventeen or so. Okay. That's and it, that's a general answer, but it, it, it's pretty close. That that's 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 good enough for tonight. Thank you very much. I You're appreciate welcome. that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the indulgence.
Okay, thank you very much. And again, to the Hanover Group, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it, it is in our best interest, no doubt about it, to work with you as opposed to against you. Um, so, so we look forward to future conversations around this. So what I think is probably best for this evening's meeting, and listen, I'll follow the leadership of the board as well, is let's dismiss the Hanover, um, the, the Hanover Group, and then let's open up to the residents. I want the residents to, um, to talk th through us, through the board, and again, that will all be on the record, and we can take, you know, we'll take the, the, the meeting notes so when we circle back around with um the folks from hanover you know we'll we'll, we'll bubble those up and, and consolidate all the feedback from the direct um the butters or residents for that matter so does that sound reasonable to the board yes mr Chief. i think so okay okay thank you for us. again the hanover group thank you very much thank you very much and we'll thank talk you, soon Chairman. thank you <clears throat> thank you very much thank you for coming in Thank you. All right. Okay. So that, and again, we there's a, there was a purpose here that we followed with the resident section after. So I know we have uh, several folks in town hall. So why don't we do this? Um, let's see where the conversation goes. But if it's for specifically the handover presentation, I would ask the residents just to keep comments to two minutes, um, and we'll just see where it goes and we'll adjust accordingly. So with that being said, let's open the microphone up to residents. And just always just name and name and address for the record, please. That's all. Thank you for your time in advance. My name is Bob O'Brien, 110 Cardigan Road. Um, pardon me for being direct here, but I kind of think I've been on a merry go round here the last 30 minutes. And Hanover's been going around and hope, hopefully two or three will reach out and grab the gra brass wing for affordable housing, the brass ring for affordable housing. Um, the only reason why they, they did their homework, they know we're, got, we're potentially exposed to uh, SHI uh, deficits post the 2020 uh, census. And honestly, we wouldn't have been in this deficit if we didn't allow 78, 78, <laughs> 79 units to get away with it in the, the fee in lieu of subsidized housing. So we are paying the town, the abutters, not Tewsbury, for poor planning practices. Poor planning practices. We can't, uh, this is 100, Mr. Ma town Manager, what is our budget, $120 million? Approximately 122, okay. yeah. This town, sure, sure. This town, $120 million, is not a small company. It's a big company. It's a large corporation that represents a lot of people here and a lot of people watching. And once this gets more out into the street, there's gonna be a lot more people here. Uh, it should be more run like a business or a corporation rather than uh, kind of somebody's playground. Uh, I say that because we don't, we do, we are so short-sighted on our planning. Show short sighted. Of all those units that were paid for uh, a fee in lieu, that last three or four years ago, we couldn't have looked down the road and see that we needed these affordable housing units three, four, five years. That's 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 only, that's only a drop in a bucket of time. We don't look at things that way. Well, shame on the whoever does the planning. You know, we, we call this community development. I call it community dismemberment. You're allowing all these large scales project, Route 38 is a disgrace. It's a disgrace. I've been here for 36 years, and how much time I have above the soil, I don't know. But when all this comes, I want what I, the 36 years plus I've enjoyed above the soil, I want other people to enjoy as well. Not just on Haynes Pond, but on Route 38 all over town. And this is not, you're not letting it happen. You're not letting it happen. So if we have a shortfall in revenues because, uh, not waited, this is not gonna fix the problem. If we have a shortage in subsidized housing inventory, putting them all in Ames Pond, taking away that beautiful pristine complex we have, 
is not the only answer. We should be looking at other alternatives to subsidize housing units. I will help do it as a, as a town volunteer if you would like. I will do that. I mean, we're building new schools. We're, we're going to be tearing down the old schools. Why can't we look at retrofitting those schools to subsidize housing? We talked earlier, and I apologize. I wanted to ask a question while the, uh, the uh, on veterans. And I'm all for affordable housing. I'm all for supporting the veterans. But the point being is we gave them money up front, and someone asked from the board, well, are two speed residents preferred? Or do they have any preferential treatment? And, and the guy, gentleman said, nah, not really. Why weren't those questions asked first before we started cutting them checks? I'm all for the say, yeah, we'll let you build a home there. But the point is, why weren't those questions asked first? And say, and say yeah, it's a great deal. Hey, because the taxpayers, we are ultimately paying for that, taxpayers. You, you took away, you, you took away seven Mr. years. Mr. O'Brien, I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up, my friend. I yeah. just got uh, yeah, kindly asked to wrap it up, that's you. all, please. But uh, I'll do my best. The point is, we are paying that as a town because you, you took away those subsidized un units to two large developers in town. You gave them all to them. And now because we're, we're, we're short, we're gonna be paying the price there. And when I talk about paying the price, we don't, we don't have the capacity with our water, our sewer, our gas, our utilities, support that volume. Never mind the traffic. We don't have that infrastructure. So you're gonna let Hanover go in, build that, and all those other costs are going to crop up six months, nine months, a year later. Who's going to pay for that? The taxpayers, not Hanover. And I want you to go on the record that Hanover's model is they are not in property management. They're in property development. So they build an apartment, huge, and they sell it. They throw out the brass ring of 40B subsidized housing and, and some towns sal salivate over it, I hope we don't. They throw out that ring for subsidized housing and all the inf infrastructure goes up and they're gone. They sell their property. Yeah, they did build Ames Lodge, but they sold it before there was a single occupant. And if you have been up there, it's, it's literally a rat hole. It's literally a rat hole. You go up there, go up there, there's 400 units. There's probably one dumpster to go up there on a Sunday or a Wednesday. You, you know. Final point, Mr. O'Brien. Final point, Mr. O'Brien. Final point, Mr. O'Brien, please. All right. Thank you. you want my two minutes? Huh? Can I defer my two minutes of all, please? No. Should I take the last two minutes? <laughs> please. Just, b b b b b b go ahead. That's, go ahead. To, um, please. We had two meetings, this meetings, with uh, Mr. Dazzo. Uh, very professional. Uh, we, their first one was March 17th. The second one was April 21st. And you talked about making concessions. Well, the first one you saw, the first one, he said he made concessions. They had townhouses behind a couple houses that that was a ploy. That was a ploy saying, hey, this is what we gave them on day one. And they had townhouses behind a couple of people's neighbors' houses. And I tell you, if one of our neighbors was cutting his grass on the Saturday afternoon, he'd be bumping arms with something in the townhouses. And they were built on land that wouldn't even compensate for a bowling alley. And number two is you have to go through 20, there's 30 acres here, 20 acres of wetlands, 10 is buildable. So they want to squeeze this massive complex on 10 acres. I'm not against building there or putting in apartments, but it's much too massive for the size. You talk about the abutters on Cardigan Road, well, you got people on Overlook. They, the, the elevation is high, and they gotta look down and see these four-story buildings. Number one, the topography. The, the lands, the, those lands are 20 to 30 feet higher than the back of my house. So I got a 40-story building on 30 feet above me. Trees don't grow that big, not in Tewksbury. Um, uh, did I mention that they sell most of the properties they build? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. And one good thing about the uh, 
that, that I've been in communication with Mr. Sadler quite a bit about our SHI inventory. Uh, I'm not quite sure we are accurate in our numbers. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe somehow who audits them, and I'd be more than happy to volunteer to audit those numbers because I've asked. There's, there's properties in the HPP, and I say, what about XYZ Street? Oh yeah, those six units there. I'm not sure everything we have is accounted to by the DHCD or wherever these uh, uh, acronyms are. That's all I have. I could uh, go a lot more. Oh, and they kept on saying, Mr. Dodds, I'll say it a couple of times, two, three, you can gain control of your destiny regarding subsidized history. Well, it's not, a, it's not your destiny, it's a recovery from all the poor decisions we've made in the past. So, appreciate your time. I'm not sure this is the first you'll hear of me up here, but uh, you know, it's, it's like reading a good novel, I can't put this down. So, I'll be back, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan, and that's why we're here. That's, that's exactly why we're here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, other residents, please. <laughs> other residents. He said other residents. Good evening. Uh, Craig Spinelli, 140 Cardigan Road. Um, how do you fall on that? A uh, <laughs> couple uh, items I just wanted to, to, to bring up. Um, to start, I don't think anyone in this room is against affordable housing or uh, a development back there. I think we all accept the fact that something will be built there eventually. Uh, we would like to see it remain commercial. Um, Ames, uh, the Ames Run development that Hanover previously built, we had been given some numbers and, and just, some people may think that this is a, a way of receiving tax revenue to the town, but just to point out uh, tax, Revenue the town receives for Ames Run is, is approximately $920,000 a year. Well, we're spending approximately $970,000 a year in education costs for the children that are housed in that, that development. So that's a net loss or, or an expense on the town, not a, a tax gain. I don't say that because I have anything against children, I have three of my own, but it, it's not a money maker. So, you know, a commercial development in that space where it should be, is really the right the right use of that space. Um, so that being said, uh, one of the concerns I have with the uh, proposed 40B, there are safe harbors that are out there for us. The town of our size, uh, a large development, there's a 300 unit maximum safe harbor law. I'd like to see that enforced so that we can uh, maintain that. The state put that out there for a reason. We should, you know, accept that. Um, I do understand the board has a right to go above that, but I think I would like to see the scope, the size of this project come down. Uh, Four-story buildings, can we go with three-story buildings? As the previous speaker had mentioned, there, the topography out there is such that you're going to build a, a four-unit, four-story building on top of a 30-foot mound already. So um, I'd like to see that come down. So. You know, waving hi to the, the neighbors on the top floor, I guess, when you cut your lawn. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll leave with is utilities. Uh, we'd like to see all the utilities come in the access road. Uh, I know there's an electrical duct bank there. I know this, I believe the sewer goes out that way. Um, I don't believe there's gas out on Route 133. So where's the gas gonna come in from? Um, I'd hate to see them have to dig up Cardigan Road, Kendall Road to uh, have the gas lines replaced or upsized. Um, what does that mean? Is that uh, patchwork in our, in our streets at that point? Or do we spend more money as a community, replace the failing water mains that we have out there and then pave all the streets again? So there's gonna be a significant cost to us. Um, maybe we truly become energy efficient and more green and enforce a solar panel project out there on the roofs of those buildings. Don't allow the fossil fuels. Uh, try to save and, and maintain the neighborhood as it exists today. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul said. Other residents, please.
Hi, uh, my name is Robert Wald. I live at 97 Cardigan Road, directly across the street from Mr. O'Brien. Um, I share the concern about the uh, tax implications of this. I spoke about it at the town meeting. It was in early May, and the town voted quite substantially to keep this property to be Office of Research. Um, so I understand that 40B can override that, but I think the responsibility of the uh, town officials, our representatives, is to uh, try as much as possible to keep that decision in, in place. Um, I'd like to question the uh, claim that all 324 units would count as affordable. My understanding of the law, and I won't claim to be an attorney, but I have seen many attorneys, some of them government, be quite wrong. Um, my understanding of the uh, rule is that it applies to low-income housing, not affordable housing, and that there's a distinction between low-income housing and affordable housing. So I'd like to uh, get that clarified, and also what is the <clears throat> What's the basis for the area mean income for this uh, this community? Is it the town? Is it the county? Uh, how is how is that computed, and how is the low income part of it computed? Um, I want to support the uh, the issue of of uh, environmental awareness, climate awareness, uh, but it can be extended not only through solar panels on the roof, but through heat pumps as a way of heating and cooling the building, uh, having induction stoves instead of gas stoves. There's a lot that can be done that wasn't mentioned in this. Um, I think I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other residents, please. My name is Greg Mann, Six of Monroe Circle. I have some environmental concerns about Ames Pond. You're building a large complex right, right next door to a pond. You're going to have to consider. I've done some research, research with uh, the school, because my property is next to the school. So I understand that Ames Pond had some regulations where uh, for plowing for snow was not allowed. It had to be stored in a certain area. The use of salt was prohibited. Herbicides, by, uh, 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 pesticides, all these things were not allowed. Fertilizer is the worst thing that you can put down and have it go into a pond. It will turn a pond from pristine to a swamp. All it will do is, it, will, it, it just absolutely ruins it. My camp is up in New Hampshire. That's one of the things that we absolutely insist on that they do not put fertilizer down because it kills a pond. Um, I really think that you have, this is just too big of a project for, for that close to to that pond, you're gonna you're gonna ruin it. Um, one of the other things for the neighbors, um, I have a three-story school going up against my property. I just looked at my property value, my property value where everybody else's property value is going up, mine's going down. I lost thirty thousand dollars on my property value from the school, and uh, so all you people who are abutters. This is not going to be a plus for you. You're going to lose money on this thing. The other thing is, because it is in North Tewksbury, and one of the concerns that we had with the fire department was the fact there is a railroad crossing, and you have a very small fire station up there. Now you're going to have to have a you know four-story building with a ladder truck access and stuff like that. What are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to expand that building in case of the fact that we have a train going across at the time? So there's a lot of infrastructure that's going on that's concerned about this. This is just, this is the initial part of the procedure. I want to make sure that all these little 
things get put out there right away so everybody understands what could happen and might happen. I thank you very much. I appreciate your courtesy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, I'm Heidi Marino, 170 Cardigan Road. I have some serious concerns that this is only rental, and I'm not against rental. North Tuxbury is a beautiful area. Uh, it's just, it's a pretty special area. When you have rentals, from what my experience has been, people don't seem to take care of them as well as when you have skin in the game and you own your property. Um, my kids were looking for a place to live when they, a few months, about six months ago. And there was a place I saw that looked absolutely gorgeous. And looks are deceiving because the, it turns, it's like a cesspool. The police are there all the time. Um, I'm not sure who's going to be maintaining or how this is going to be operating, but um, it, 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 it it kind of it, it brought the area down, and a lot of people didn't want to go in there because it's it's not it, it, it's different when you own a place or you rent your own place, but when it's just a rental. And in, in this area, I just question the area. I mean, I think it'd be much better served in research or, or, or a scientific kind of um, area, like Ames Pond on the other side. So I'm con very concerned about that. Um, I think there's going to be a huge police presence. It's going to definitely bring our property area down. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Ronald Shilley, 90 Cardigan Road. I'm on one of those uh, direct abutters. I, I, just a couple of quick points, some of them already kind of brought up, but um, one thing I, I do want to point out, and it's pretty obvious to me, uh, because I am a director, but I, I just feel this project is just doesn't belong there. Five four-story buildings, 364 units, abutting Cardigan Road. I think one of the criteria uh, that 40B states is that the project needs to fit the design and architecture of where it's going. And, you know, it's, it's abutting you know, very close to a, a residential neighborhood. And this is five four-story buildings in a 10-acre lot. This is, a, I think, about a 30-acre um, overall lot, and it's about 10 acres buildable. That's just, it, it just doesn't, um, for me anyways, it, it, it doesn't go. Um, one other point or question I have is, so one of the benefits that Hanover mentioned, and I think it's a good thing, like, for the town, right? Uh, we do need revenue. Um, but I have a question, I think, for the board. So would you guys run a financial feasibility study to understand um, the revenue that this potential project would bring in and then weigh that against the expenses uh, to the town itself, whether that's schools, uh, utilities, uh, public safety, those kind of things. So we can actually look at the numbers to say, it, not relying on them to say, yes, it, it's going to be a financial um, plus for the, for the town, but we actually validate that. Um, so that's, I, I guess, a question I have for you guys, whether it's rhetorical or not. Um, and then the last um, point that I want to make, um, there was talk of, about um, the uh, utilities and what's currently there. So I'm at 90. Um, in between 80 and 90, there is an easement. Um, there's been discussion about the potential of running a high-pressure gas line from existing Cardigan gas infrastructure up to that property. Now, being 20 feet from that line, I obviously have issues with that. Um, but I think that extends beyond just the, the two houses that, the, uh, that it may run down in the easement. Um, I assume the, uh, the, in, the gas infrastructure in, the, in, in, in Cardigan is not going to be able to support an additional 324 units. Um, so, you know, concern there about how that would run, safety issues, obviously. Uh, the Columbia gas uh, disaster catastrophe a couple of years ago is still sticking in my head. And having a high pressure gas line running through my house um, won't let me uh, sleep very well at night. Um, so those are just a couple things I kind of wanted to point out, uh, get them on the record, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, great points. Uh, 
Ken Alley, 100 Cardigan Road. I am, I am one of those, those two lots that he was pointing the cursor at when he was talking about the abutting neighbors. Um, the, the last project that, that was on, on that site, the, the one by, uh, by Mark, Ober, uh, Mark uh, yeah, uh, had, a, uh, had, a, had a, a cut and balance site which means that they were, you know, moving dirt from the high points to, to the low points and everything. That resulted in an embankment against my property of at least 20 feet. Um, this is a um, obvi obviously when you put a five-story build, four-story building on, on on top of an embankment like like that. It's, I mean, it's there. It's looking down on you. Um, I I would like to suggest that that the board. Um, recommend to the developer or whatever the correct term is, is is that this uh, this this site plan re respect, if you will, what they what they've shown on, on a site plan, which is the fact that the perimeter of this site fits elevation wise w within the elevation at that hundred foot setback. So that so that they're not going to the hundred foot setback building a building a you know a, a large fill and uh, you know and putting buildings on top of it that to make it fit more within the association within the development uh, the, within the rural uh, the um, rural atmosphere of it that that these kind of big cuts and fills. They just they just don't belong there. It it has to fit a, a little bit better than that. And I'm not saying that they're not planning on doing that. They haven't shown us that, but just to kind of get that up front. And the other the other thing is that we had we had recommended to them at their last meeting. Um, they've got one building. It isn't up there anymore. But they they've got one L-shaped building, which the building itself is set back a ways, but the L shape points points down toward us with uh, um, the, there's, there's really no reason that with just a little bit of rearranging of their parking lots, they couldn't flip that L so that it pointed into the complex rather than out of the complex. So, so I'm, and you know, they may be thinking about doing that anyway, but. Let me say that you will notice on the first. You can't speak without yeah, a no, microphone, You're out of sir. order. This yeah, is yeah. televised, no one can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you much. Thank you, Councilor Rush. Thank you. Kevin Donnelly, 8 Westland Drive. I just had a couple of points, uh, information almost. Uh, the comment about one of the previous speakers about uh, affordable housing versus low income housing. I mean, the numbers, the 360 units and 53 units. If only the 53 units qualify, why are we even talking about it being an affordable housing project? Uh, you're not doing us any favors. I'm not saying you should. But you Mr. Not. Donnelly, Don't please, please direct your housing. comments to us in the chair, not to the applicant, please. Okay. Thank you. Don't, the chair <laughs> Don't somewhere pitch it as an affordable housing project if that's in the noise, OK? And it appears that way that it is. I mean. Why don't we have the, you know, that 300 units? But I doubt whether very much whether that qualifies. The second question I have is, they took a ride to Westford because they heard they built another one over there, and I looked at it, and I thought it was in front of General Motors. It was a beautiful office-like type building. I mean, it's a beautiful building. I'm not 100% sure we want that hanging over Ames Pond, but that's something that the town has to decide. But it seems like we're stretching the affordable housing point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolly. Can I, can I go back to add something that Ken said? Let's, let's let make sure everyone. Mr. O'Brien, no, Mr. O'Brien, just quick, one minute, please. One minute, please. Um, one minute. No, you can you can go. You, oh, I have one minute. Yeah, one minute. Thank you. You got yeah. thirty seconds now. seconds now. You're running right out. <laughs> I thought he's putting his earplugs in. Tick, I'm sorry. Tick 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 tick. The uh, 
to parlay what Ken said about the, uh, that knuckle yell, you will notice the first design that I called the ploy that was there, and, and quickly we said we don't like it, and boom, in 30 seconds, it was gone. Okay, so the, the next drawing they had that Ken talked about, they presented on our second meeting, had an L-shaped or a knuckle. Well, that wasn't there in the first drawing. So pay close attention to the first drawing to that one. That changed from drawing one to drawing two. And the second thing is we've asked them to take that out, uh, to look at other opportunities, and that goes back to uh, uh, April something or other, and uh, we hadn't heard anything. And um, my last correspondence with uh, Mr. Dazzo was on May 27th, only seven weeks ago. So he talks about open communication, and then he calls me last night at five o'clock and says, do you know there's a meeting tomorrow night? Are you going? So, you know. Understood, okay. And, and the other thing, traffic. Okay. There's gonna be, there's a bunch of traffic out there now, and people- Mr. O'Brien, we're with you. We're, we're, Mr. O'Brien, we're with you. We're, we're with you, my friend, okay. The, I want to let other residents speak. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Good evening. Jessica Randolph, 1484 Andover Street. So just given my location, extremely aware of the traffic that has I don't know, double, tripled since I've lived there, 30 years plus. And we have um, the road backed up between Lowell and down to 495. So this traffic feasibility study, I would like to have some better understanding of the timing of it. Um, when it, would that happen um, in terms of how far along would this project be? Because I think this is a really serious matter. It's not just a matter of the congestion, the backing up, but the traffic, the inconvenience. I really have to say that there's a lot of health issues from having cars sitting on the road. We all know asthma rates in the Merrimack Valley are very, very high. We live next to 495. Um, the noise and the air pollution, it, it don't, don't let it fool you. Just because you can't see air pollution, when you come down with lung disease, you'll know about it. So I, I do ask about that traffic feasibility study and like to know um, what is the time frame for that. All right, and thank you. Mr. Montour, support my neighbors here. Thank you very much. So Mr. Montour, just keep me honest. If the Hanover Group would have come back with a LIP application, everything from A to Z would be in that application, correct? Uh, we'll ask for that information and, and um, it'll be part of the discussion the board has with the applicant. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Other residents, please. Hello, Laura LaMontagne, 70 Cardigan Road. Um, for the record, I do not abut the property. However, I am one south of the abutters. And I was not invited to the meeting to inform the intentions of this project or um, what the extent was. I do abut Ames Pond. Okay. So I would like to see uh, the transparency increased further to other surrounding properties rather than just those direct abutters. Uh, two, I would like to reiterate the comments of my neighbors in regards to what the town's true concerns are um, in respect to affordable housing. If we should approve 324 units for uh, low-income housing, but only 80 of those, or roughly 80 of those, count, then that seems like semantics to me. Uh, I would like further explanation there. Okay. Uh, furthermore, in terms of the financial feasibility study and the traffic feasibility study, will the town be involved in those studies or are we simply to take the word of Hanover Research Group? Yeah. So I would like to see a representation from the town in those feasibility studies rather than taking the word of Hanover. 
Uh, and that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. My name is John Haddon, 240 Cardigan Road. I'm one of the original Cardigan Road people. And I was here five years ago when we went through this whole thing when another developer wanted this. And the three things that came up were single egress, single access. The lady talked about school buses, fire department, emergency vehicles, police department. The other gentleman brought up the fact that the fire department is on the wrong side of the, the, the railroad tracks, other than the infrastructure they're immediately going to look for a second egress. And that's going to be a problem. Andover wouldn't allow it for the last developer. We don't want it through Cardigan Road. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nick Iannuzzi, 150 Cardigan Road. Uh, last thing in the world I wanted to do was be up here. But, um, you know, after seeing what was built on the other side of the pond, I feel like, you know, it's all hands on deck. So um, let me just say, uh, this is not first time defending this, this land. And uh, my father used to say, um, the land defends itself because it was a lot of wetlands there. And over the years, it's definitely shrunk. The, the wetlands have, have shrunk for one reason or another. So now it's our turn to defend it the best we can. Uh, apartments is just the wrong thing for that area. Um, but if for, for one reason or another you guys do decide to go ahead with this, uh, the owner of the, the land did tell me that that other side that you guys were talking about, he said that he would donate it to the town. So make sure that that's part of the in writing. It was just a verbal to me, so make sure that's in writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other residents? I think we're done, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay, so let's just say a few closing words here. So the bottom line is we, we, we hear you loud and clear. We're with you. We're, we're residents ourselves. Um, and so, and someone I think made a very good point. Probably tonight was mainly the director butters. And we had some, not in that area, but uh, we mentioned earlier, myself and some of the members on the board, where this impacts uh, all 30,000 plus residents of Tewksbury, make no mistake about it. So a um, lot more work to do here. We're going to capture all of the all of the uh, items that were that we heard today on the record, and we'll follow through on each and every item um, to the best of our ability as a board. So that is, I know that's my commitment. I know that's our board's commitment. So with that being said, why don't we go ahead and close out the resident section? And what we're going to do now as a board is move along to new business. So thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May we take a five-minute recess? Please. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Yep, be back here at uh, 855, 855. Thank you.
Are we ready to uh, reconvene as a board? Yes. yes. Please. Okay. Okay. I just want to say first, I know, I, I wish I could have been there. It wasn't fair to the board. I could not do, you know, the work, I, I could have done nothing because of my work schedule today. So I apologize to the board and to the residents. I should have been there uh, in person. So um, I, I, I'm happy I'm on the WebEx here as opposed to missing it. But I just, um, show my, I just want to show my appreciation to the board. That's all. Okay. All right, let's move to new business. New business, local local housing authority tenant seat appointment. So for this one here, um, we had um, we have a vacancy. The vacancy is set to expire on April fourth, two thousand twenty three. We currently have a state a government uh, governor appointee, a state appointee, Miss um, Cheryl Wright, and her term expires. August 26, 2001. So, Ms. Wright was asking if we could appoint her to the town uh, appointee tenant member, and then what we would do is subsequently um, take one of the, the three or four candidates that applied and um, have them go through the governor or the state appointee position for this particular board. So, does that make sense to the board? Yes, yes. it does. Okay, and we did get some letters. We got a few. Uh, we got a letter from Mr. The Future. He's on the board as well as uh, Mr. Deemers as well. In the, um, the, uh, glowing support for Ms. Cheryl A. Wright. She's been on the board, uh, tenant. She's been involved from day one. So um, two outstanding letters of recommendation for Ms. Wright. So with that being said, I'll pause. Any questions, concerns, or what's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, please. I I'd like to make a recommendation, unless anybody has any comments, to appoint Ms. Cheryl Wright to the local um, housing authority as the tenant seated appointment. Is that a motion? Yes, it is. I would second that motion. Okay. And that's the end date of expires on uh, April 7th, 2023. Okay. So I have a motion. I have a second. Any discussion? Hey, what's the pleasure of the board? Roll call vote. Ms. Stronach? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And Mr. Chair votes aye as well. And Mr. Chairman, Please. I would like to say that Bob Demers from the um, partnership is in attendance tonight as well as providing that glowing recommendation. Okay, very good. Thank you for the call. Thank you. Okay, very good. All right, uh, the next order of business uh, business is the election staff appointments. I believe in our packets we should have received the, um, I'm just gonna go to my packet quickly. Uh, we should have received the packet from the town clerk, Ms. Graffio, with her recommendations for appointments. So, any questions from the board? No, Mr. Chairman, I'll offer a motion to approve the staff recommended by the town clerk and specifically note the municipal disclosures filed by uh, Christine uh, Cicero, um, Alexandra uh, Loudon, Nancy Tornaime and Lorraine Carrier all in our materials. They all have um, employment uh, in some capacity elected um, or appointed uh, positions within um, our municipal government, and they are disclaiming that for purposes of Barbara Flanagan also, and Barbara Flanagan as well. I was going to say, right, catch. Yeah. Second. 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 Okay, I have a motion and a second. Ms. Trotter, how do you vote? Um, I do have a question. Um, Barbara, okay. I did not see Barbara Flanagan's disclosure in my packet. Is I'm assuming that that has also been submitted to the clerk. Yeah, I'm sure there's a copy submitted to the okay. clerk. She's just, it's noted in the list. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I vote aye. Okay, I have a motion, okay. Ms. Wellman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. All right, next order of business is name street approval. Is this, um, keep me honest here, board, is it Grammy's way? 
Grammy's way. Yep. Gram- Grammy's way. And just for the record, they did. Um, so all the paperwork, again, we're the authority to figure to approve the street name. And just for the residents, they, we did, um, per, per, per town leadership, we did have to remove the apostrophe S. And so just my Grammy's way, just with an S. So I think all the paperwork was in line. I saw no issues from the town. So with that being said, what is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we um, accept the street name as Grammy's Way, as proposed. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. All right. Next order of business is the Tewksbury, um, the, I'll say the accurate, the Tewksbury Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion Advisory Committee appointments. So, I believe we have six seats to fill. Um, we had interviews on two separate meetings going, dating back, um, the previous month. So I believe now it's our, the order of business is to appoint six, six seats. But prior to that, I'll open up to the floor for questions or comments. Mr. Chairman, because just, I do um, have one couple of questions, ahead, Mr. Johnson. Um, have we? Uh, and and I don't know the answers to these questions because this board, my predecessor board, took action on the mission statement and formation of this committee before I joined the board in April. Um, but my question is: um, Have we uh, taken steps to invite the school committee to make an appointment to this committee or to recommend a? school committee member to this board for appointment and concurrent with that have we invited the um, school system to help identify a student representative um, who might be interested in appointment as those two positions are part of the potential roster that's correct i don't believe so no i don't believe so mr johnson they, we they do have the, they do have do the mission statement and they're aware of the yeah. seats, yeah. but we have not heard from yeah. them. Okay. So, you know, again, I think if we're taking steps to make appointments, I presume the committee is going to want to start to meet. We need to encourage that response on those two seats so that we have a full committee. So I think we should take some steps to remind the school committee and or um, school administration to help us with that if they are interested. Agreed. Yep. Okay. okay. One question I did have, it looks like we, during the, um, the advent of the committee, we positioned three years and I think they were probably going to be staggered. So I kind of, um, that was one question I had for the board is do we want to maybe, re- I don't want to change things, but do we want to reconsider maybe yearly appointments or was the purpose, the principles there, I believe it was for staggering the, um, the six um, appointees? I think the purpose was to initially appoint two one-year terms, two two-year terms, two three-year terms, and then fill them in as three-year terms so that they're not all up at the same time. That was our initial, that was how we structured the, um, the document and the appointment for this committee. Okay, I'm highlighting that, okay, okay. Yep. Yeah, and, yeah, it's right there. Mr. Chairman, um, just I guess from my vantage point in my prior service on the board, um, some number of years ago, Mrs. Stronach may recall this as well, um, we had um, taken steps to outside of appointments that are required by statute to be in excess of a year, we adopted a policy to limit terms to one year or 12 months. Um, and the, the reasoning, quite frankly, is at the time we had um, members of committees that were multi-year appointments and they were not attending meetings. Um, and in most instances, we were not able to take any action to vacate the position and fill it with another interested party, for example. Um, so we adopted a policy of 
um, every 12 months um, appointing um, or reappointing. Um, and while I appreciate the spirit of this might be a multi-year task, this board would certainly retain the total discretion to keep the entire roster in place, just make the reappointments on the 12-month cycle. So I'd ask my uh, fellow selectmen and women to um, consider that because I think it would be more consistent with the policy that was adopted and in line with all the other appointments that we have made recently and will continue to make. Makes sense for that being a form of a motion. Um, I'll offer it in the form of a motion to limit the terms to tw uh, 12 months. I'll second that. Okay. I have a motion. I second any discussion. Yeah, I have some discussion. Okay. Um, we have a policy that if you don't attend something like two or three meetings, he has that policy. We don't, we didn't adopt it. It's a, if it's I can a, just okay, finish my thought. So I beg your pardon? The bylaw. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's a bylaw if you don't attend so many meetings. Mm -hmm. right. right. It's a bylaw. If you don't attend so many meetings, then you can be removed by the chair and reappoint, which seems to address the issue you have. Well, um, it's only one, um, Ms. Wellman. There, there are other reasons that could come up that aren't attendance related. So That you wouldn't want to keep people appointed to the board. Potentially. I mean, I think the issue here is for institutional memory. Um, and to show that commitment. I don't have really an issue except that mm -hmm. the fact that yeah. we can't seem to appoint people to boards this year. We're having difficulty as a board getting it done. So I don't want to see this kind of stuff go on where now we have boards that are languishing because we haven't appointed people to them and they're not meeting. And so if the board is able, if the committee is appointed and they can continue and they're just appointing a few members every year, in this case it would be two, I think that continue, that there's a continuity issue. You know what I mean? So if I recall, I believe our last meeting, we had discussed looking at the structure of this board. Mm -hmm. So I know there was some discussion around that. I believe uh, there were some proposals about how that could be done. If, if we go with the one year to start and kind of give it that first year to get up, figure out the formation, figure out how it's going to do business, yep. and then reassess. Does that? I think it also gives an opportunity to um, see what the interest is from all of the people that we interviewed and to come mm -hmm. forward and say, maybe we want to increase it or not at that time. I mean, I can be amenable to it, but I do want to make sure that everybody's aware that if people don't attend meetings, they can be removed. Yep. So we're not no. going to, you know, sit around waiting on that. I would agree. Yeah. That's not the sole reason for my raising that. We've okay. had other issues in the past with other appointees for various reasons. And I just think we are the appointing authority and we should maintain control of that process. And I do agree with you, um, Ms. Wellman, sure. that we could be uh, more um, efficient perhaps in, in making our appointments. But I've been on this, uh, sitting at this table with you now for I think four meetings. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job so far. All right, any other further discussion? I have a motion on the table. Any other, any further discussion? Okay, so the motion on the table is to, to, to have all the particular seats here at large, the six at large seats for just a one year term. So with that being said, uh, roll call vote. Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? No. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. So that's four to one. So the motion does carry. So they'll be set to one, um, one year term. So with that being said, why don't we go into the, um, what's the pleasure of the board to nominate applicants at this time? Do we want to, as a proposal, do we want to um, just have each member go around and nominate one person? And then if there's a second and then vote that way? Um, or create a slate. Uh, we have so many great. Whatever applicants, works for so. the board. We're usually very open for the board, so we can e e either way. I just sure. either way. Oh, well, I would make a motion Whatever. to appoint Mason Dunn. I'll second that. Yep. Okay. 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 Roll call vote. Ms. Stronach. Aye. Ms. Wellman. Aye. 
Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well, so that's one. That was Mason Dunn. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like Please. to make a motion to appoint Margaret Ricardo. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, motion and a second. Roll call vote. Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. So that's the second seat. Mr. Chairman, I guess if we're going down the table, I'll offer a motion. Um, and I would uh, offer a motion to appoint um, Sean Gannam. I'll second that. Okay, for Sean Gannam. Okay, I have a motion. I have a second. Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. I would make a motion to nominate Ms. Beth McFadden. Mr. Chairman? Please, um, yeah. Did I recall that um, she withdrew? And she, or she said that she, there was so much interest in that she had other... I, I, she was somebody that I was um, interested in well, but... She reached out and said that she would um, probably attend the meetings, but would like to have her name... She did not officially withdraw. Yeah, but she said that there were so many good candidates okay. that she okay. would submit. So, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you. So that's, that's no, yeah, I'm with okay, you. Okay, thank I'm you very much. No, you did not. <laughs> okay. Pick someone else. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> Um, I would like to make a motion to nominate um, uh, Marilyn, um, um, Marilyn Eloy. Eloy. Yeah. Eloy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Second. So I have, a, I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wallman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well, so that was the fourth member at large. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to nominate uh, Ms. Georgia Bay Allen. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. That was the fifth. And last but not least, the sixth member at large. I have three people I'd like to nominate. <laughs> we have such a great, we have such a great, um, really great group of people. It's very hard. Um, I would um, nominate Aaron Kelly, who um, folks may remember was um, Bentley College Dean, if you remember from your interviews. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well, and I think that concludes the appointments. So just, um, just, okay, to, very, summar just to summarize, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have Georgia Bay Allen, Mason Dunn, Merlin Eloy, Sean Fatty Gainham, um, Aaron Kelly and Margaret Ricardo as our new diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory committee once they get sworn in and they'll receive a letter to that regard. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you to the town manager, um, can we also send a letter to the other um, applicants thanking them so much and informing them um, that they're invited to attend all meetings and we look forward to their participation um, genuinely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much to the board. Okay, thank you very much. We should also ask the town manager to reach out um, 
to the superintendent and see if they, if you could speak with the school committee and the um, principal, high school principal. Right. Yeah. About the student. My apologies. Yep. Yep. With you. Yeah. Very good. All right. Speaking of town manager, Mr. Montori, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. The first item uh, on my report is the October 21st, 2021 uh, uh, town meeting. Um, I'm recommending that the board call for a special town meeting to be held uh, October 5th at 7 p.m. at the Tewksbury Memorial uh, High School. Uh, that's the first uh, item I'm recommending. Uh, this is in line with <clears throat> um, when we've had our special town meetings in, in the fall. Uh, which is the first Tuesday of the month. Okay, what's the pleasure of the board? I'll make that motion to approve the um, special, the schedule for the special town meeting for October 2021 as presented. Second. Okay, motion second. Roll call vote, Ms. Stronach. Aye. Ms. Wellman. Aye. Mr. Mackey. Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes Aye. And that was, that was for October 5th, correct? Correct. Correct. All and, right, thank you very much. And, okay. se and second, Mr. Chairman, uh, that the warrant for special town meeting to be held October 5th uh, be opened uh, starting tomorrow, July 14th, and close at 4.30 on Friday, August 20th for warrant articles. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Ms. Stronach, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Jo Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. That's confirmed. Thank you. Um, the next item I have is a release of restriction for the former police station lot at 984 Main Street. Um, a document has been provided to the board that was drafted by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Massachusetts through DCAM uh, regarding the uh, former police station lot. Uh, as the board knows, um, the uh, lot um, in question uh, sat for many years um, vacant uh, with a building on it uh, from approximately 1998 to uh, 2015 uh, when we um, uh, advertised a request for proposals uh, from interested parties to purchase the land. Uh, at the first um, uh, set of proposals that went out, nobody uh, submitted any, um, any responses to our RFP. Uh, we went out a second time and we received one proposal uh, from MDR Construction uh, who um, had a bid price of $165,000 for the parcel. The parcel uh, came with uh, restrictions uh, based on a piece of legislation um, filed um, by DCAM. The parcel had a restriction of providing a buffer for the housing authority property as well as 20 spaces uh, for the housing authority property that, that abuts it. Uh, so that restricted, uh, in our opinion, uh, interest from uh, other people who, uh, who could have been on the property. The um, legislation also called for the proceeds uh, from the sale of the land to be split 50% with the town and 50% with the uh, Commonwealth. Uh, after the land was, uh, after the RFP went out and the bid came in um, and the uh, purchase and sale was signed, uh, I spoke with uh, DCAM about uh, further legislation to allow the town to recoup its costs for demolishing the old um, or the former police station building that was on the parcel. Um, that cost the town approximately $133,478 to take the building down as well as uh, remediate any um, asbestos and hazardous materials from the building. Uh, I asked the Commonwealth to net out that amount from the sale price and split the net proceeds, which uh, ended up being $31,522 between the Commonwealth and the, um, and the town. Since 2016-17, we've been going back and forth on this issue. 
uh, finally came to resolution. Uh, legislation was passed to and uh, agreed to that uh, the town could net out uh, all of its costs and um, the Commonwealth and the town would split uh, the $31,522 net proceeds and the town would be able to recoup the additional costs for the uh, demolition of the building. In order to finalize that um, uh, particular and very specific uh, item, uh, the board needs to approve this uh, release of restriction uh, as provided by uh, the Commonwealth, approved by town council, uh, as well as the attorney for the uh, buyer. Uh, I just want to note uh, that uh, I know there's been some question about the price for the parcel uh, and the development of the parcel, uh, but uh, again, I want to stress this land was sold in 2015. Uh, it's a 6.49 acre parcel 4.5 of it is wetlands. Only 1.5 of it uh, is upland that can be built on. It also has riverfront protection issues. It has a sewer easement going through it, as well as a, re a requirement to provide 20 parking spaces for the housing authority. So uh, it did come with its restrictions, but uh, the process to sell the land and the purchase and sale dates back to uh, 2015 timeframe. So it's been a while. It's not as we didn't just sell it in the last few weeks. Um, so with that, I would recommend that the board um, approve the release of restrictions. I have a document here for the board to sign uh, that came in from the Commonwealth today, um, and we can move forward and uh, close on the property. Questions, comments from the board? I would just like to say that um, I am pleased to see this uh, come to an end and that this is not similar to uh, the Livingston Street property and the work that we've done with the state down there. Because um, while the property was sold in 2015, I think that this dates back prior to that. Um, so um, this has been almost a decade in the making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's summary. Yeah. I have a motion to have a second. You have a second. Okay. Ms. Strada, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a Invoice for town council for June 16th, 2021 through June 30th, 2021 in the amount of $3,145 and I would recommend approval. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. I have a motion and I have a second. Ms. Tronick, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Wellman. Aye. Mr. Mackey. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Anything else, Mr. Montori, on your side? Uh, just quickly, um, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, the town <clears throat> will be having a, uh, a holding a uh, household hazardous waste day uh, at the Senior Center on July 31st from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, there will be a fee uh, to uh, dispose of the uh, household hazardous waste items. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, 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 uploading uh, detailed information on the website tomorrow and getting and getting information out uh, to the residents and to our local media to uh, put in the papers. Uh, but I just wanted to mention it will be held uh, July 31st from 9 to 1. Um, and uh, the town is part of a uh, reciprocal uh, regional agreement where uh, we will allow uh, residents from uh, other communities, uh, there are 18 communities specifically, uh, in the region uh, to come to our household hazardous waste day. Uh, they are allowed to um, uh, come between the uh, hours of uh, 11 and 12. Uh, but because we entered into this uh, agreement, uh, Turksbury residents are allowed to go to their household hazardous waste days when they hold them throughout the year. Uh, that again is posted on our website. I am so glad to hear that. Thank you. All right, I do not believe we have any minutes to report, so it brings us the board member reports. Let's start with Ms. Stronach at the top. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to mention that the events committee is going to be meeting on um, this Thursday on the 15th, and the elementary school building committee will be meeting on the 22nd. And I have nothing to report since our last meeting. Okay, Thank you. very good. How about, uh, how about Ms. Wellman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, NIMCOG is not meeting this month. Um, the um, hiring committee for the new director is meeting next Wednesday, and I'm on that committee, so we'll be doing starting that work um, up very soon. Um, because we opened and closed the, uh, set the dates to open and close the, um, the warrant for town meeting, um, I'm curious if our board would um, entertain the idea of the manager writing up an article changing, uh, asking town meeting to consider changing the name of the board of selectmen to select board. Um, that's something that would have to be approved by town meeting. Um, and it, I think it requires a <laughs> petition to the uh, state legislature, actually, because it's sort of a chart. It's a language charter change. It's pretty common in the state right now. Um, lots and lots of towns have done it. And uh, so the language is out there and pretty easy to find. Um, but that would, be, that would be an article from the Board of Selectmen. Well, Mr. Montori, could you bring that back to a future agenda item to see what that entails? Sure, Mr. Montori. Are we meeting before the 19th? We yes, are. they yeah. scheduled the uh, closing of the uh, warrants after, after that the week. next yeah. board meeting, That's so you had a chance to go through it. So I can draft the warrant, no problem. Uh, I'll check out the details to make sure uh, the process, and uh, I'll get everything to the board uh, well ahead of that meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, so so we'll put on the agenda. We'll have future discussion around that item. Um, okay, thank you. Anything else, Ms. Wellman? No, thank you very much. Okay, how about Mr. Mackey? Uh, I have no updates, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, very good. How about Mr. Johnson? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would just um, want to take a moment. I want to thank the many residents who have um, volunteered to serve our community in different capacities. Um, it is uh, unusual that we had in the, uh, the instance that we appointed to the committee this evening um, more applicants than positions to fill. I think that's a great sign. Um, Unfortunately, um, you put us in a position to have to pick people, um, some over others. Um, I don't think that's a reflection of any of the people who applied. I think it's the law of numbers. Um, and I want to encourage those people that were not nominated or voted uh, to be appointed to continue to participate um, as residents. And um, I know that there will be other opportunities uh, for them to hopefully or potentially participate um, in helping to guide our town on many issues in the near term. Um, over the last few years, um, in my experience, we've seen more and more people in new faces um, raise their hand to participate in local government at a volunteer level. And I think that reflects well of our residents and our community. So I'm really happy to see that. Um, and I also want to just take a moment to thank those that we appointed last time um, for their service. And I want to remind them and, and encourage them to make sure they get sworn in. Um, I think if I recall correctly, we set a deadline of August 1st um, to make sure that happens. So hopefully they're taking steps to get that accomplished so we can take full advantage of their volunteerism. <clears throat> That's all I have this evening. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I'll go one step further for that particular committee. If that, uh, we, we did limit the number to six. However, if we do get participants in that particular committee, you know, that, that go there week in and week out, or, you know, every meeting and attend all the different activities, then, then I, I would expect that committee to come back and say, you know something, six wasn't the right number. Maybe it is nine, 10, whatever that number may be. So, um, so, so just to kind of piggyback on your words there as well. That's all. So, um, very quickly, we met as the reuse committee. We, um, we met with the open space and recreation committee. It was a very good meeting. This is with to do with the Trey Hahn and North Street. 
Um, we kind of went into the meeting as a blank canvas. You know, what would you do? Benefits, uses, possible uses. And I'll tell you, the committee gave us a lot of good insight, valuable insight as to potentially what we can and can't do. So um, I anticipate putting on the uh, select board agenda where we probably have to open up one more committee, uh, one more uh, one more. Uh, committee space on the reuse committee to have someone from the open space committee come in because there was a lot of synergy and we're going to do the same thing for uh, all the different boards and committees in town and the department says as well so stay tuned but it was a very productive meeting um and last but not least, let's end on a very positive note. So a major shout out to one of our very own uh, 911's dispatch workers, Rebecca Marqueo. Um uh, unbelievable where it was probably a week ago to this date where she in tandem, you know, through a 911 call, worked with a two-year-old boy's uncle to resuscitate the little boy uh, from the pool. So it was a magnificent magnificent story for Tewksbury, uh, and we will rec- will recognize Rebecca in a future select board meeting uh, coming up, but it was uh, what a positive uh, outcome to a not-so-positive situation. So just tremendous work by, um, by Rebecca. So with that being said, uh, I look for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I have a motion and a, do I have a second? Second. Second. Roll call vote. Mr. Stronach. Aye. Mr. Wellman? Aye. Mr. Mackey? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.